Hello, and welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. Thank you for listening this week to another episode. This is a place where I talk about health and wellness and biohacking and everything like that. Welcome to all of the new listeners and the new subscribers, and welcome to all of the OGs who have been following and listening for years. I love getting all your DMs about how you listen to this podcast and where you listen to it. I just received one today as well that said she's new to the podcast and she's listening to me while she's working out. And I I just love that. So welcome. Everybody is obviously welcome here. And today's episode is part of a short series that I'm doing for the next, I don't know, four weeks, I guess the next month or so. And it's kind of a deep dive into different topics and kind of how you can hack those different things. So this kind of came out of my episode, I think it was last week where I talked about biohacking, like your morning routine, evening routine, your work environment, your car, things like that. And it was such a, honestly, it was such a long episode, but it was great. And then I was like, well, there's actually so much more that I can share about each of these topics. Let me just break it down into its own kind of episode. So that's what is going to be coming up. I'm doing an episode for each topic. So today is all about sleep. The other ones will be, there's going to be five. So it's going to be sleep, nutrition, exercise, work, and mind. And they're going to be a bit shorter episodes. We'll we'll see. (laughs) I say that now. And we are going to go into how to upgrade these areas of your life. The cool biohacks you can do, the free things you can do, the products you can get, what's worked for me, what the research says, and why it matters at the end of the day, like why we really need to be doing this. So today is all about how to upgrade your sleep. And I just think it's pivotal to start here. Sleep is so important. We sleep one third of our lives and a lot of people still think it's underrated or don't just, they just don't value it. And I really, really want to change that. So if you don't have your sleep nailed down, you might want to take some notes on this episode and get inspiration so you can kind of figure it out. And I'm going to share my own journey as we go along as well about, you know, how I'm sleeping right now, things I've struggled with in the past, stuff like that. Before we dive into that, a shout out to today's partners. Neurohacker, oh my gosh, I am absolutely obsessed with their products. They have very, very unique biohacker e, we'll say, like with a Y on the end, biohacker, biohacky, I guess, biohacker e products. So they have wonderful nootropics and they also have a wonderful product called Qualia Senolytic. And this is a product that is really, really focused on longevity and anti-aging and kind of cleaning up the cells. So you'll see a lot of big names in the biohacking world talk about this product because there's not a lot out there that does what Qualia Synalytic does. So it basically helps get rid of those old dead sluggish cells and brings in the new ones so that you can be and work faster, your body functions better. But it's only two supplements once a month, like two days out of the month, sorry. So there's a bunch of supplements you take on those days, but it's only two days out of the month, which is such an interesting concept. So they have a ton of research behind the product. And I just think it's brilliant about how to level up your cellular health in a very healthy, non-all-consuming way. So I love Qualia Senolytic. That's by Neurohacker, linked to my show notes and on my website. And you can use my discount code, Brittany, in all capitals, and you can save. And you actually get to save on all their products. So if you want to also add in the nootropic, which arguably is the best nootropic on the market, which is all about brain health and how to optimize your mind and thinking and focus and memory and everything like that, that nootropic is powerful. I think it is the best one I have ever taken. So that is also what I love from them. And then a shout out to Lila Quantum Tech. They're also kind of everywhere right now, actually. They produce products that neutralize EMF. So the way that they do this is they really take a look at quantum energy 
And how can we change quantum energy and get it to be more in our favor and less EMF, less radiation, less toxic energy around us? And so I have a couple of their products. I have their Infinity Block, and this is in my room. And then I have one in my office. And I also have their Heal Capsule, which like hangs from your neck on like a necklace. And then I use this when I travel, especially when I go on flights. So it neutralizes all of the EMF around you. They have a ton of research studies. I think they have like over 60 different studies on their products, which is very impressive. It's all on their website. So definitely check them out if you care about EMF. And we actually are going to talk about EMF today because we're going to talk about the bedroom. So dive into those. If you are a mega biohacker or you're just starting like me, that is totally okay. You know, it it's a journey and it's fun. Honestly, it's really fun. It's fun to try these new things and these new products and new ways of doing things so that you can be better. So I'm here to inspire you and give you my two cents for what it's worth. And I would be remiss if I did not announce that my baby course comes out next week. I guess it's not a baby course. It's a preconception course. So it's preconception health, fertility, and this is all about how to optimize that time in your life. Guys, you want to get on the wait list. I'm not kidding when I say that only the people on the wait list are going to get $100 off. Once it goes public in March, like it's on my website, you know, it's up and running. Like that, that promo is gone. Like I'm, I, I kid you not. So if you are on the wait list, I will be personally emailing you a little surprise next week and you will get your personal $100 off coupon code and you will get early access to the course. Just so exciting. And you have lifetime access. And it's basically everything that you need to know to optimize your health for your fertility and preconception. There is a lot in there. This is for men and for women. There is so much men can do for their sperm health. It is not talked about enough. So do not think that men are not included in this because that is far from the truth. And it has my 90-day cleanse in there. Minimum 90 days is what I like to say. And this is going to walk you through everything that you need to do daily for those 90 days. And I am so excited about it because I've seen clients have success with this cleanse and my protocol. And this is kind of why I made it into a course. And so I'm just so excited for it to be out into the world. If you have a friend who's struggling with fertility or preconception, you want to send this to them. Like I'm 100% serious. It is all natural. This is the type of thing that you want to do before IVF, before IUI, before looking into something that's very substantial and could be very harmful and hard on you, hard on your body or your friend's body, whoever's doing it. And also a ton of money, like very big financial investment. So if you know somebody who is struggling to get pregnant right now, please send them this wait list. I will be emailing each of them individually myself next week. And we can talk about how you or your friend can get pregnant naturally, easily through a very holistic health biohacking lens. All right, let's dive into sleep. Let's dive into upgrading your sleep. We are going to start with the circadian rhythm. I'm going to explain the circadian rhythm to you, what it actually looks like on an like hour by hour, kind of hour by hour scale for 24 hours. Then we're going to get all into how to upgrade the different areas of sleep, what you can eat, drinks, things that disrupt your sleep, your bedroom, everything like that. So If you struggle with sleep, like this is the episode for you. Whether you wake up multiple times throughout the night, whether you struggle to fall asleep, whether you have, I don't know, a different type of insomnia, or you have sleep apnea, or you know someone who sleeps really badly, this is for you. I really want you to take notes. You know, you can always save this episode on Apple Podcasts, like you can download it save it and then go back to it to click on things later. That's always what I do when I listen to podcasts is I download the episodes. I listen to them. Most of the time I listen to them offline. And then I will keep the episodes where I want to go back and and click like something that was mentioned 
in the show notes. So I really recommend you do that. You can also always find it on my website if you are interested in something that I said and you forget. And then two weeks later, you're like, oh yeah, what was that recipe for a midnight snack that makes you fall asleep in five minutes? Okay, let me find it. So yes, that will all be there for you. Okay, so let's dive into the circadian rhythm. What the heck is that? And how do we optimize it? So circadian rhythms are biological processes linked to the cycles of the day. Many body, bodily functions vary according to these rhythms, including your body temperature, your pulse rate and blood pressure, reaction time and performance, the production of melatonin, serotonin, and cortisol, which we're going to talk about in a second, and intestinal activity. We have seen this, you know, there's so much research on the circadian rhythm. It's not something new or something like, you know, that's a new frontier that we don't understand. But we have an eternal clock, essentially, that kind of dictates how everything is kind of processed in our bodies. And light has a very, very big impact on this. So light clearly has a central role in the regulation of our daily lives and can be used to reset our circadian rhythms. Luminosity should reach at least 1,000 lux in intensity to have such an effect. Compare this to the 320 to 500 lux in a typical office and the 3,200 to 130,000 lux in direct sunlight. Light directly affects the production of melatonin, the so-called hormone of darkness or sleep hormone, which is secreted mostly by the pineal gland during the hours of darkness. Melatonin is so important, and there's a bunch of ways you can actually test your melatonin, but we'll get into that. What's interesting is a newborn baby does does not actually produce any melatonin until it's three months old. So from then on, the production increases towards adolescence and finally settles down in adulthood. In a middle-aged person, the production of melatonin starts to decrease again, and it is suspected that this is one of the reasons why older people do not usually get as much sleep as younger people, which is very, very interesting. So it's interesting, like, the babies have, you know, for the first three months, they don't have any melatonin produced because that is when they struggle the most with sleep, and that's when parents are up all night with them. So I'm going to be doing, like, a bunch of content on that in the future, but it makes sense, just a little note on that, if you're a mom or if you're expecting, is that is probably part of the reason why when women pump breast milk, they will label one bottle night breast milk, like nighttime, and then the other bottle daytime, depending on when they pump, because nighttime breast milk has actually been shown to have more melatonin in it than daytime, and daytime breast milk has been shown to have more cortisol in it. So if you are in the middle of the night and say you have you know, you're giving your baby a bottle of your breast milk versus just off of the boob, that breast milk that you pumped previously during the night is actually better for them at night because it has melatonin and they don't produce any melatonin for the first three months. Same goes with during the day. You want to give them the daytime breast milk because it's higher in cortisol. And imagine if you flip that. Imagine if you gave the baby a bottle of daytime milk at night. Imagine getting a spike of cortisol and then trying to sleep afterwards. I don't think so. So that is something I see a lot of moms doing now is like labeling their bottles, daytime, nighttime, and I think it's very smart. And this makes sense of why people are doing that. Have you heard about Synaletics yet? It is a class of ingredients discovered less than 10 years ago, and they're being called the biggest discovery of our time for promoting healthy aging and enhancing your physical prime. So you know that I absolutely had to get my hands on this. Your goals, your life goals, and your career and beyond require a lot of productivity. I feel that and you feel that. But let's be honest, the aging process is not our friend when it comes to endless energy and productivity. That's why I started using Qualia Synaletic. As we age, we all kind of acquire these cells in our body that are called senescent cells. They cause symptoms of aging that we both feel. Aches, pains, slow workout recovery, sluggish mental and physical energy, and everything kind of associated with that. They're also known as zombie cells. Basically, they're old and worn out. 
and not serving as useful of a function as they once did. So we can take something like qualia senolytic, which helps remove these worn out senescent cells to allow for the rest of our cells to absolutely thrive. And one of the best parts is that you actually only need to take this supplement two days out of a month. So I like to do this once every quarter. So I'll do one month every quarter where I take these supplements just to really clean out the house, to sweep out all of the old zombie cells and really create space for the healthy new ones to absolutely thrive. And you can do the same. You can resist aging at a cellular level just like I am by using Qualia Senolytic. Go to neurohacker.com slash Brittany for up to $100 off and use my code Brittany at checkout for an additional 15% off, which is huge. That's neurohacker.com slash Brittany spelled B-R-I-T-T-A-N-Y for an extra 15% off your purchase. Let me know what you think. It's also linked right on my website in the show notes. So it's super easy for you to use. Light, like I said, is so, so important for this circadian rhythm. The intensity of light isn't the only factor in melatonin production. Its wavelength also has an effect. And we definitely have talked about this in terms of red light and blue light. So during the daytime, blue light, which is like a shorter wavelength, around 420 to 485 nanometers, dominates, which blocks melatonin production. So that's why during the day, you actually want to have blue light. You want to have blue light coming off your phone, coming off your computer. You want to see the sun, which has a ton of blue light during the day. You want that because that is what is supposed to happen during those hours of the sun. And then research shows that white LED lighting is five times more efficient at blocking the production of melatonin than incandescent light bulbs. That's very interesting because incandescent light bulbs are obviously a bit more yellow. So you can use those at night to kind of increase how much melatonin is is being produced and not block it as much compared to having these like white LED lights, which we definitely don't want. So in order to optimize sleep, it is important to understand how other hormones influence the circadian rhythm. High levels of dopamine and serotonin have been linked to, to the feelings of alertness and adversely low levels of sleepiness. This is like, you know, we've seen this, like you've, you've felt this, right? Like imagine like going to a wedding at nighttime, right? Like you're feeling so excited. You're feeling so happy. You're not going to be feeling as tired as normal when you're having all of those good hormones kind of running through your system. Cortisol, on the other hand, which is known as the stress hormone, contributes to sudden wakefulness in the middle of the night. Its production is especially active for the first 30 minutes or so after waking up. And we are going to get more into that. So I want to walk you through a 24-hour cycle just so you understand kind of what happens every couple of hours for you. And so we can have a very, very clear picture of before we kind of like start to hack things and like upgrade things, what is actually going on on a daily, nightly basis. So let's start at 6 a.m. So 6 a.m., 6.45 a.m., you have the sharpest rise in your blood pressure. 7.30 a.m. ish, these are all ishes, right? Like they're all plus minus. Melatonin secretion stops. And just so you know, for this, we're assuming that the sun rises at 6 a.m. Okay, so this is like more of a summer summer morning. 7.30 a.m., your melatonin creation secretion stops. 8.30 8.30 a.m., your bowel movement is the most likely, which is two and a half hours after the sun is woken up. 10 a.m. is your highest alertness, which is very interesting. So I find that interesting because like, if you plan your work day, you could plan your presentation, your test, your podcast recording, anything like that at 10 a.m. maybe when you are the most alert and the most awake and have the biggest energy rush. Then we hit noon, not much really happens around noon. And then we go to 2.30, which are the best coordination skills. 3.30 is the fastest reaction time. Five o'clock is most efficient blood circulation and greatest muscle strength. That's interesting because that could be a really good time that you could work out. So because you have the best muscle strength then. However, 
you mentally might not be the best at that point. So you might be mentally tired and have to push yourself to go and do a workout, but your muscles might be primed at that time for workout. Six o'clock, obviously we hit nighttime. The sun starts to set around then, ish. (laughs) 6.30, you have your highest blood pressure again. Seven is the highest body temperature. Nine is the melatonin secretion starts and 10.30 bowel movements are suppressed and then we hit midnight. 2 a.m. is your deepest sleep zone. 3 a.m. is your lowest blood pressure. 4.30 a.m. is your lowest body temperature. That's kind of like what we're looking at here. Now, mind you, everybody will be slightly different. It's going to be different on the season and we are really... It's just kind of like a snapshot and an idea. So let's get into tools for really upgrading your sleep. I want to start with the bedroom, of course. My, I was going to say my favorite place, but really it's not. (laughs) But there is a lot you can do to biohack and upgrade your space. So first and foremost, the most important thing arguably for the bedroom is the lighting. So you want to darken your room and you really want to set up optimal lighting in your room. Sunlight, moonlight even, and LEDs on electronics can disrupt sleep. So what you can do is you can use blackout curtains, which I have. You can darken the LEDs of your electronic devices with black adhesive tape. So I actually have, I'll try to find the ones that I have and I'll link them in the, in the show notes. I actually have these stickers. I forget who I bought them for, from but they're little round stickers and I have a set of red ones and black ones. And I just put them on top of like any little lights in my bedroom. So for example, I have a Dyson fan in my bedroom and it's an air purifier and it has a light on it that will show you like what level it's on from zero to 10. And I put one of the red stickers on that little light. So now when it shines at night, it's only red and it's like much, much harder to see. And those have been very helpful. They don't ruin anything. They're really easy to take off. You can put them on the wall. You can put them on anything. And I've put them anywhere that there might be like a little baby light showing through. You can also switch lamps to brands that do not emit the blue spectrum of light, which I have. I will link those in the show notes. I have the ones, I have two from Amazon. They are fantastic. They have white, white light, red light, blue light, green light. I only use the red light basically. And it also is on a dimmer, which isn't the best for EMF, but still. And this is such a game changer. So at night when I'm sitting there reading, I am reading in red light. There's no blue light that comes from it. And they were very, very affordable and easy because it's Amazon. So I will link those for you. Um, So exactly, these special lamps change the spectrum of light according to the cycle of the day. And then you can also get dim salt lamps. So I have a salt lamp. I will also link it from Amazon. It's in my bathroom. And we kind of use this. So like when we're brushing our teeth, if I'm washing my face, taking my contacts out, anything like that in the bathroom before we go to bed. So in the bathroom, there's like this single salt lamp that's on. And then there's the two red lights in the bedroom. And then that's the only lighting that's on. And it is wonderful. (laughs) And it makes it very like easy to fall asleep. And yeah, it's like a little red cave in there. I'm actually like speaking of, I'm actually thinking about, I posted this on Instagram like a few months ago, but I'm thinking about trying to make a headboard for my bed out of salt, Himalayan salt, which is like dimly lit behind it. So I was in a, I was in California in October and I was in a spa and it was beautiful and had this like salt room, this relaxation salt room. And when I'm sure you've been in them, but you know, the whole wall is salt. It's like the pink Himalayan salt. It's beautiful and it's backlit. It's very like dim. And there's all of this research out there and health benefits of like the negative ions that are secreted by this salt, especially when it's like warmed slightly by the lamp behind it. And it's just also like beautiful. It's a nice glow. It's very like nighttimey. And I was like, oh man, like how cool would it be if we could make this into a headboard behind us and 
either have the light on all day or maybe just have it on at night and just get our bedroom to kind of be like a low key salt room. And I was like, oh, how would you do that? And then I actually looked into it and you can buy the bricks. You can buy the bricks of like Himalayan salt and you can make it and then you would like make it in a frame, like a wooden frame. And then you would, you know, you'd have to figure out the electrical, but then you would attach it to the wall behind you, which would be beautiful. And then I'm recently talking to a sauna company because I'm moving and I'm trying to get an outdoor traditional sauna. And I'm talking to this company called Northern Saunas and I, they actually sell salt walls for their saunas. So I'm going to actually ask them like, hey, can we build a headboard for my bed? (laughs) That has nothing to do with the sauna, but I just want this in my room. So we'll see if that actually is feasible and doable because I think that would be so, so cool. And also if you want a business idea, go and take that idea and please make this a business. Make like salt furniture that's beautiful that you can sell to biohackers because I will buy it and I will work with you. (laughs) So that is what I would do. I think salt lamps are beautiful. There's so many different types and they are, yeah, the perfect lighting. That is the most important thing. If you're like me, you are thinking about your energy field. You're thinking about radiation, EMF and 5G around you. And honestly, you're kind of worried about it as well. What if I told you you could just get a product, put it in your house, set it and forget it and know that you're actually reducing the amount of EMF and radiation around you? That's where Lila Quantum Tech comes in. Their products actually neutralize EMF, even in electric cars. And this is so, so important because we are so bombarded with the amount of EMF and radiation in today's society. So their key product that I love is their Infinity Block. And it has actually been proven to increase ATP production, which is the energy in our cells, by 20 to 29%. So this really, really does matter. Leela Quantum Tech has over 59 studies and they actually also have another six in progress. They are randomized, placebo-controlled, and double-blind studies proving the great benefits of their products. I really suggest you get this infinity block. If you can get something that you can put in your house and say, hey, this is actually helping to neutralize how much EMF me and my family are exposed to, it just makes sense. Why would you not want some sort of safety measure like that that you can count on? They also have a heel capsule, which is like a little capsule that you can bring with you anywhere you go. And it does this same thing, obviously, to a smaller degree and smaller circumference around you. So I like to wear this when I go on planes because there's so much radiation on planes and EMF. And I like to wear it just in general when I travel. Their products have been proven to optimize HRV and improve your blood and obviously ATP production, like I said. So that's what I would do. I would really recommend looking into how you can manage your quantum energy field better because this is such a key aspect of optimizing your health. You can get a significant discount through the link on my website and also in the show notes and that will help you be able to get this at a better price. So again, that's Leela Quantum Tech. I have the infinity block. It's in my bedroom. I actually sleep right beside it. And then I also have their heel capsule on a necklace that I take with me everywhere I go. And these are the two that I would recommend. I think this is a great starting pack for you and provides substantial coverage in order to neutralize the EMF that's around you and optimize your health. Okay, then we want to get into bed quality and ergonomics. So bed materials that do not breathe may induce allergies and beds which are unergonomic, may disrupt your sleep. So let's talk about mattresses. A mattress or futon made of organic cotton, wool, hemp, or natural rubber, instead of being covered with polyurethane foam and chemicals that are potentially allergenic. I have one of these, I and I will link it in the show notes. I bought it from a company called, I think they're called the Green Bed Store. And it is very, very clean, like no toxic anything. The wood, like the wood bed frame stacks together. There's no glue. There was no, like none of that. It's like the most breathable 
way of doing it. And I worked really closely with them to be able to get a really nice bed. There are other companies as well you can look into. I think a really popular one for mattresses is, I think it's called Natru- Naturopedia. No, I must look it up, but I will link that as well. There is there is one that is green gold certified, non-toxic, and there's a few that you can really go for if you're looking to update your mattress. You, When it comes to pillows, you can look at oat, cherry, spelt, or buckwheat pillows, choosing materials for your sheets and blankets that promote better thermoregulation. So things like organic cotton, leather, silk, etc. You want to be careful with plastics here. Sleeping without clothes <laughs> so that the rubber bands in the waist cannot block your lymphatic system. It's very interesting. I have never been anybody like I cannot sleep naked. I've never been able to do that. And I wear very, very loose pajamas. So I will wear a long sleeve that's very loose, pajama pants that are very loose. Like I buy sizes bigger than I am because I don't want any tightness whatsoever anywhere for this reason. And also it's just way more comfy. It doesn't get like bunched up anywhere. So be careful kind of what you're wearing when you go to sleep in terms of blocking your lymphatic system. We definitely don't want that. You can also try sleeping without a pillow. There's some people who talk about the circulation with that. Using a pillow that supports the neck. This is really important. I have one. Where did I get it from? I think I got it from Amazon. That's fabulous. And I will link it for you. This is what I use actually so that I sleep on my back. I was a side sleeper for so, so, so long. And it has created mis, like imbalances in my body for sure. It's created neck pain, shoulder pain. My shoulders cave in. My posture isn't as great. My spine has like changed because I've been sleeping on my side since I was a kid. And, you know, about, I think it was last year was when I started training myself to sleep on my back. And the number one thing that helped me do that was this pillow. Because essentially it's like a pillow that on each side, so if you're lying down, you're looking up at the ceiling. On each side of you, right by your ears, the pillow like comes up and is stuffed more so that you actually can't turn your head. You actually can't turn to sleep on your side with that pillow. Like it's very uncomfortable because then you're kind of like sleeping on like an angled pillow. So that's what I use. And then I also put a pillow underneath my knees so that my spine is supported. And then I sleep on my back. And that has been the only thing that has taught me how to sleep on my back. And now, I'm still, I wouldn't say I'm 100%, 100% a back sleeper. I would say I am a 70% now because it takes time. But I feel so much better, way less neck pain, huh, way less neck pain than I had last year and the year before. It's made a huge difference. Having a pillow between your legs. So if you're sleeping on your side, you want to put a pillow between your legs. This is going to support your hip and your knee. Because otherwise, if you don't have a pillow in between your legs, if you're sleeping on your side, the leg that is on top is going to cave in and is going to be just put way more, way more pressure on the bottom hip knee joint. And we don't want that. We really want the weight to be more balanced out and the pressure to be more balanced out. And the way that you do that is through a nice, you know, proper sized pillow in between your knees. So my mom actually taught me about that years ago. She's an occupational therapist. And I started doing that, I think, in high school. And I am I struggle to sleep without that now, if I ever sleep on my side. And then I just transitioned it. Like I said, when you're sleeping on your back, you put it underneath your knees so that you are, again, supporting that spine and supporting all the pressure points. So sleeping on your back or sleeping on your right side, other positions put stress on your internal organs. If you suffer from heartburn, sleeping on left side or on your back is a better option. Use a heavy comforter and bed sheets if you have a tendency to change positions frequently during the night. Sleeping on your stomach is not recommended to anybody except to those suffering from spinal disc herniation. Sleeping on your back is not recommended if you suffer from sleep apnea due to the risk of respiratory arrest. 
So sleeping on your stomach is terrible for you. (laughs) For many reasons, like, you know, posture is one of them, joints, pressure, the pressure on your internal organs, your digestion, where do you put your arms, the pressure on your face and your skin? No, just no. And if you are a stomach sleeper right now, I would really, really recommend looking into getting some of these pillows that can kind of help transition you to either sleeping on your side or ideally sleeping on your back. All right, we definitely have to talk about EMF and electromagnetic pollution in the bedroom. So some people may experience sensitivity to electromagnetic radiation. Dozens of studies have been conducted on electromagnetic hypersensitivity, which is known as EHS, but its existence has not been successfully verified. Some studies suggest that grounding can alleviate insomnia. I personally don't have this EHS, but I know people who do, who are extremely sensitive to EMF. So it makes sense. And there are some things that you can do to kind of help with it in your bedroom. So you want to use a grounding mat. I do not own a grounding mat. I cannot give you a recommendation. I just kind of go outside, but there are a ton of them. There's also grounding sheets, I guess, like a bed cover. I forgot the name of the brand that everybody in the biohacking world uses, but you know, the claim is that it basically helps ground you while you're sleeping because of the different wiring that is in it that connects it to the earth's frequency. I think, I think that is how that works. There are other people who out there who talk about this, who know way more than I do. So look, look that up. You can also be mindful of your phone and your Wi-Fi. So placing W-L-A-N routers, so just routers, and mobile phones at a distance and switching mobile devices to flight mode. Note that a 20-minute call will emit more radiation than a base station per year. Nobody likes when we talk about how much EMF comes from phones (laughs) because no one really wants to accept it, you know? But there is a ton So if you have your phone in your bedroom, it has to be on airplane mode. And this actually goes for any smart devices. If you have a smartwatch, if you have, what's it called? The Apple watch. If you have an aura ring, anything, it has to go onto airplane mode. Otherwise it is emitting electromagnetic pollution right where you are sleeping. And also this includes your partner. So if your partner is not on board with this type of thing, you might want to have a little discussion about it because you are likely sleeping right next to them and that's not far away and it will be impacting you. So you can walk barefoot during the day or use grounding earthing shoes. I use the Bahe ones. I will link them in the show notes for you. These ones are my favorite. They are, so they ground to the earth's frequency, which I think is so important. And they are very stylish. So they're really nice shoes. They look good. They look like just nice shoes that you would wear out. They don't look kind of weird or I don't know. Some of the other shoes I've seen just look a little funny, but these are the ones that I love and recommend. I have the pair in white. They're very easy to clean and I wear them when I walk my dog, that type of thing. And then obviously you can scan your bedroom for radiation and you can do this with an EMF meter. Again, I have one of these. I will link it in the show notes. I think, I forget what the name is. It starts with a T. I bought it on Amazon and it's very interesting. So it's a little eye-opening. It's a little sobering (laughs) to say the least. So if you want one, just get ready to like learn about your radiation and get ready to like do something about it. Because once you see the numbers, you can't unthink about it. You can't unsee them. And then I would really recommend like putting some strategies and tools into place to really mitigate those high numbers. So we also want to talk about air quality. Research shows that poor indoor air quality affects respiratory organs and can thereby cause sleeping problems. So instead, you want to try ventilating the bedroom during the day. So you can just open your windows. That's what I try to do. Excluding the possibility of mold. So DIY measuring kits or measuring done by professionals especially if you're in a moldy city, like like a place that has a lot of mold. We, when I was in New Zealand, our house had so much mold in the closets because the place that we were living in New Zealand was so damp. 
And that's probably the moldiest place that I've ever lived. Yeah, it was a little, it was a little scary thinking back on it. Like, for example, the house that we stayed in was a townhouse. It was like stacked. One of those like houses that has many floors stacked, like many small floors. It was maybe like five floors or something, but they're tiny, they're small. And the bedroom was on the bottom floor and we backed onto a forest. It was beautiful, but the closet ended up like we ended up getting mold on our clothes in the closet in that house, which was shocking because I've never had mold just collect in a closet. Like I've just never, ever seen that, but it was very damp. New Zealand's a very different place. So yeah, just be mindful for that type of thing. The use of house plants to increase humidity, turn carbon dioxide into oxygen and release negative ions into the air. I love house plants. I have many and I actually don't have any in my bedroom, which is kind of sad. We have many in the living room and kitchen and area and stuff like that. But that is something I'm definitely thinking about for my new house is like, what plants do I want to put in the bedroom for this reason? So you can get like a golden cane palm, a snake plant and a devil's ivy. Those are all great. My recommendation to you is if you have pets, if you have children, hang your plants from the ceiling. So we have a couple of these and I just bought like really pretty pots and I germinated a couple of plants and yeah, and then they just grow down. Like ivy is a really nice one for that. And then you just water it. Obviously it has to be by a window, but then it's kind of doing its thing, ventilating the air. It's not taking up any square feet. And it's out of the way from any hazards from like cleaning perspective, of, but also danger perspective in terms of a dog or a kid. You can ventilate the bedroom properly at night, but avoid a direct draft near the head because this has been shown to be like destructive of your, of your sleep. And then you can use an air filter. So a UV HEPA carbon filtering type of idea. Like I said, I have the Dyson one. It's fabulous and it's worked very, very well. I've had it for years. And it's very high quality. There are a few other ones. I actually have another one too. Oh, I have the Air Angel, which I will link that. That one's really, really great as well. I use that in our bathroom that's prone to mold that doesn't have any windows in it. And it's really good for just helping filter the air in there. That is one of the like biohacky wellness brands. So I will definitely link that for you. Adjust the humidity and you can with technical tools. Most people typically prefer 30 to 50% humidity. If you're over that, see what you can do. <laughs> definitely not my area of expertise in, in terms of like how to manage humidity inside, but it can be very uncomfortable. I remember when I was traveling to Singapore, the humidity, I think was like 88% out, outside. And it's just wild because my hair went so curly and there's nothing you can even really do. Like you're just kind of hanging out in the humidity. It's so warm. So if that's your case, I would definitely look at things to kind of get you into that 30 to 50% range. Having a house that ventilates properly and choosing appropriate indoor materials, natural construction methods, eco paints, and finishing materials. Eco paints is interesting. I have recently had to learn about this because we bought a house, we're moving, and I'm painting. I am painting my new office. And so I have found a very, very eco friendly painting company, and I will link it in the show notes for you. I think it's called Ecos. Let me just bring it up on my phone. I'm looking at a few different colors from them. But this is the one that is like the most green toxin-free one. Yeah, it's called Ecos. The website is ecospaints.net. I will put that in the in the show notes for you. And I am doing this. There's a couple of walls in the kitchen I'm changing. And I'm also changing my office. And I really wanted to use paint that was super non-toxic. So the good thing is, is like nowadays there's kind of solutions for all of these things. You just have to do the research and find it and get it sent to you or get access to it in some way. And then last but not least, using specific incenses and relaxing essential oils like ylang ylang, vanilla, lavender may increase sleepiness at the cost of air quality. 
I, this is like something I haven't really dabbled into too deeply. I feel like I do this type of thing in my office. I don't really necessarily do it in my bedroom. Some people love their diffusers in their bedrooms with the scent. I, you know, with a fan on, with a filter on, with the windows open, it kind of just doesn't really make a difference for me. So I don't do that, but hey, maybe it works for you. Okay, then we obviously have to talk about temperature. So the temperature of your body drops during sleep. Sleeping in a room that is too hot or too cold makes it difficult to maintain optimal thermal regulation. So instead, you can try adjusting radiators and air conditioning, keeping windows open and ventilating the space properly. The optimal temperature for most people is around 18 to 22 degrees Celsius, which is 64 to 69 degrees Fahrenheit. So I, you know, with that, we, so in the past, because we're in an apartment right now, we have an air conditioning unit and we will bring that out in the spring, use it for the summer and put it away in October typically. And we like to keep the room very, very cold. And in the, in the winter, I will still open the windows and get the room to be nice and cold during the day so that by the time we go in there at night, it's cold. I never, ever put the heat on in the bedroom, ever, ever. But I am in an apartment building, so it's probably a little different if I was in a house. Just because I want it to be cold and I want to be warm underneath my duvet covers. We have really thick duvet covers. I want to be nice and cozy, but I want the air around me to be cold. Like I said, 64 to 69 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So now we're going to talk about kind of what you can do during the day to really optimize your sleep at night. So I said this kind of earlier, we want to be getting enough blue spectrum light during the day. Getting enough of this light, especially right after waking up, is an important factor in maintaining one's alertness and circadian rhythm. Spend time in the sunlight. Take a minimum of a 15-minute walk daily. Set up your workstation next to a window. Avoid the use of sunglasses during the day that block blue spectrum light. It may start the production of melatonin at the wrong time. And use a full spectrum light therapy lamp. So I have never been a fan of, I've never been a fan of sunglasses really. I understand a lot of people like them for obvious reasons, you know, blocks the glare can help with aging lines, fine lines around their eyes, that type of thing. However, I usually get tired when I wear them. I don't feel as alert or awake. And so I don't usually use sunglasses. And I I try to recommend people don't either. And then for exercise, you really want to be exercising every single day. I don't think I should have to say that. I think you should just be doing that. should be part of your healthy habit routine. And you want to do about 30 minutes of exercise a day helps to balance the daily circadian rhythm and significantly improves sleep quality. I think 30 minutes a day is low personally, but in terms of like just what the research says in terms of like how it's helped with sleep, that's what it says is like a minimum minimum of 30 minutes a day. And then you also want to get rid of any muscle tension you're having. So pain in the muscles and connective tissue may cause insomnia. Try acupuncture, massage, sauna. There's so many things you can do. Yoga, stretching. And then you can also take a nice relaxing bath before bed with magnesium chloride in the bath water during the evenings. So I'm going to kind of get into magnesium in a little bit, but that can be very, very helpful for relaxing muscle tension and anything that's sore. And it's so funny saying this because I actually had this last night a couple of days ago, I did a arms, shoulders workout from Peloton and I pushed it too hard. And my neck and shoulders were kind of sore yesterday, but I'm one of those people who is the most sore two days after a workout. It's never the first day. It's always the second day. And so today I am really sore and I woke up in the middle of the night because I guess I was sleeping on my side, which I shouldn't have been. And I was sleeping on the side of the shoulder that I guess was more sore. And I I don't know what I did in my sleep, but I must have pulled it, slept on it funny because I woke up at 3 a.m. with such pain that I actually couldn't go back to sleep until 5 a.m. 
and I had to take a hot shower. I had to put heat on it. I had to put a hot water bottle on it. Then I put ice on it. So I was alternating hot and cold therapy. It was a mess this morning. It was such a mess. And then I went back to sleep and slept for another three hours, which made me feel a lot better. But it was not great. So tonight, what I'm going to be doing is doing exactly this of massaging it. I have like a back massager thing that I can use. I'm going to be putting heat on it. I'm going to take a hot bath with magnesium salts and right before I go to sleep and really just trying to ease that tension so that it can kind of be better tonight and I can sleep through the night. Next, let's talk about getting ready for bedtime. So you want to go to bed by your circadian rhythm. Going to bed and waking up at the same time every day increases the quality of sleep and decreases health risks. This helps balance your nocturnal body temperature and minimize and also minimize moonlight during the night because it can interfere with melatonin production, which is such a funny thing. Like I don't I feel like we don't talk about moonlight a lot, but it can kind of come through your curtains if your curtains don't fully block the window. So just be mindful of that because that light can actually be very, very bright from the moon. So there are a ton of nutrients that we can take and supplements that we can take for to help with sleep. I'm going to talk about some of them. I'm not going to talk about all of them. And I will link the ones that I have personally used and had success with. So supplements and adequate nutrients in your diet can support the body in the production of melatonin, help the body to relax, and just like help us in the right brain wave pattern that we need to be in for sleep. So magnesium is by far the best player in the game for this. If you are not taking a magnesium supplement, please do so. Please order one today. Please get one. And this is so, so important for so many functions in the body. You know, anxiety, muscle tension, you know, sleep. Just There's just so many things that it helps with hormone production. And we really just want to be making sure that we're getting enough. Most people are actually deficient in magnesium. So magnesium citrate acts as a mild sedative that helps the body to fall asleep. It also increases the amount of deep sleep and decreases nocturnal cortisol levels. An appropriate dosage is 400 milligrams. On the flip side, magnesium glycinate, magnesium glycerphosphate, and magnesium taurate also provide amino acids that support liver functions at night. The appropriate dosage varies from 200 to 1,000 milligrams. So I've talked about this before. There are many different types of magnesium. We want to be taking a full spectrum magnesium supplement. The one that I use is the one by Bioptimizers. That This has all seven, seven, yes, seven types of magnesium in it. So if you're listening to this and you're like, hey, I don't take a magnesium, maybe I should take one. You should probably take that one. It has all of the different types in it. You don't need to worry about like, oh, how much magnesium citrate is in this? How much magnesium glycinate is in this? No, you don't need to worry about that. It is formulated correctly with the right dosages. And there is on their website, there's actually a bunch of information on how you can up your magnesium levels. But you can also just take some before bed, depending on what you want to do. I personally take one to two a day, regardless of anything going on in my life. And that is what I recommend my clients do and my family does, my friends, my family. And then I also have bioptimizers magnesium powder. And I will take this before I go to sleep if I want that extra boost. They also have a sleep powder and I will link, I'll link all three of these so you can take a look at them. That has some other nutrients in it that I'm actually going to get into here. And that's very powerful. So this morning was a really good example of this. So when I wake up, when I woke up with my shoulder really hurting, you know, I did the hot therapy, did the cold therapy, and I drank a glass of Bioptimizer's sleep formula. And I, you know, was sleepy again by 4.30 and I went back to bed and it was very, very helpful. So it doesn't actually have any melatonin in it. It's just melatonin precursors. So there's no negative side effects. You can use my link and my discount code Biohacking Brittany. You get a lot off. It's like easily the cheapest way to do it. So please, please do that if you're not on magnesium. You can also look at things like tryptophan. So tryptophan acts as a precursor to serotonin and melatonin. Tryptophan levels can be elevated in the evening by consuming some of the following foods. 
about like one to two hours before you go to bed. So you could do like white and brown rice, banana, but not overripe or overripe, pumpkin seeds, turkey, chicken, eggs, nuts, whole grains, lentils, sesame seeds, sunflower seeds, fish, avocado, and calcium and vitamin B6 facilitate the absorption of tryptophan. So yes, it is true. When you have turkey at Thanksgiving and you're tired, It is because of the tryptophan, partially, because the turkey is high in tryptophan, which is a amino acid. Relaxing adaptogens, there's reishi, holy basil, ashwagandha, a lot of people know about those. Then there's theanine. Theanine increases alpha waves and can be helpful for falling asleep. Experiments with rats have shown that theanine improves the quality of sleep when coffee has been ingested during the day. You'll see L-theanine in a lot of supplements that have like green tea in it. I think L-theanine is actually naturally in green tea, or you'll see it added to nootropics, like the one I was talking about from Neurohacker, which is really great. And this just kind of helps reduce that energy spike if there's caffeine added to the nootropic. So it kind of like lessens the spike and then crash, which is why you kind of get energized from green tea, but it's not the same spike that you would get from coffee. Zinc naturally raises testosterone levels and sufficient levels improve the quality of sleep. And then we can obviously also talk about GABA. So taurine decreases stress and anxiety and increases the amount of the anxiety inhibiting neurotransmitter GABA in the body. An appropriate dosage is 500 to 1500 milligrams of taurine every night one hour before bed, and 250 to 500 milligrams of GABA two to three times a day. I love this. I think it's really important. And the sleep formula I take from Bioptimizers is exactly this formulated. So I will just take that at night if I feel like I need the extra boost for my sleep. There's other things you can do as well. Like you can do 5-HTP. These 5-HTPA is very therapeutic. Like I would not use this, use this on a daily basis. So you can take 100 to 200 milligrams of 5-HTP, which is actually quite a lot, or 0.3 to 3 milligrams of melatonin an hour before going to sleep. I mean, I, I prefer 5-HTP, but I also try not to take it very often, again, because it should be therapeutic and not something that's part of your daily stack. Vitamin D can help, but vitamin D you only want to be taking during the day. Do not take it during the night and try to take it with fatty foods. Vitamin D interacts with the melatonin production. So if you take it at night, you are kind of interfering with your sleep hormone being produced. This goes for the same with like kids. If you have kids who are on vitamin D supplements, which a lot of you do have and, you know, recommend, just make sure that they're taking it during the day. You know, vitamin D is a sunshine hormone, right? Sunshine vitamin, it's actually a hormone. So it makes sense to obviously take it when the sun would naturally be up. I definitely want to talk about like different, I guess like substances, but also drinks that you can take that, you know, help with you falling asleep and then also disturb you falling asleep. So obviously, you know, there are substances that disrupt your sleep. And, you know, the one that obviously comes to mind first is caffeine. So This can come from coffee, tea, energy drinks, mate, and you want to avoid this five to eight hours before going to bed. I I typically cut my caffeine around 1 p.m. And if I go to sleep around 9.30, that's accurate. So just just be careful of that. And you also want to avoid theobromine and theophalene, which is both found in cacao or cacao cacao and koala nut six to 10 hours before going to bed. Limit late evening alcohol consumption to two doses maximum. Alcohol reduces REM sleep. Enjoy your last glass of alcohol no later than 90 minutes before going to sleep. I am not drinking. I haven't had alcohol in a long time. So just be very mindful about when you actually stop having that. So there are some drinks that can and beverages that can really help you fall asleep. And these include things that kind of typically affect the GAB, the GABA anxiety inhibiting neurotransmitter in the brain. So you can do valerian root, you can do chamomile, passionflower, hops, and kava. 
Kava is really cool. I had Kava in uh, Fiji when I was there. It was, yeah, it's very interesting. It's got a lot of regulations around Kava in North America. It's very hard to find in Canada specifically, but it can be very, very relaxing and it's very gentle. Like Kava is very, very gentle. Like you don't feel high. You don't, you don't feel funny you, like you do if you have like cannabis or anything, but you definitely, definitely feel more relaxed. So it's nice. And then you obviously want to like maintain adequate hydration through the night, throughout the night. So dehydration, but also excessive water consumption can actually keep you up at night. So you have to kind of find that like middle ground that you can kind of optimize. So drink water, especially if you've consumed common diuretics like alcohol, coffee, or tea. Limit your beverage consumption in the evening. If you notice you often wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, you really want to stop drinking about 90 minutes, I would say, before you go to sleep. The liver is typically at its most active between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. And wakefulness during these hours can be a sign of dehydration. Saw palmento or nettle root teas might alleviate prostate problems that could be also contributing to this. So some other tips that we want to get into as well is kind of like what I was talking about is like we really want to decrease your body temperature before going to bed. The temperature of the body drops during the night and the body and the drop can be aided in a number of ways. So avoid exercise because exercise equals stimulation of the central nervous system and rise in body temperature for two hours before going to bed. So say if you exercise at five, you know, maybe you want to go to bed at, I mean, seven is very early, like, you know, 8.30, 9.30, you should typically be okay. You can practice cold exposure in the evening, like a cold shower, winter swimming or an ice bath, and that can help with that. And then also try sleeping naked. A big thing is with a lot of us is like tossing and turning, worrying about things. Maybe you are thinking about your to-do list or your personal to-do list or your work or your project or your kids or whatever it might be. And this can really, really disrupt how we are sleeping. So we want to empty your mind of the worries of the day. After a long work day or with a large workload ahead, it is especially easy to get stuck with incessant thoughts which stimulate brain activity and prevent falling asleep. Use meditation to empty your mind. Stop working an hour before you go to bed. Honestly, you should stop working at least three hours before you go to bed. Write down a to-do list for work tomorrow so that unfinished business does not get stuck in your head. This is so helpful. I always do this. I love my lists. I love my to-do lists. So I would really, really recommend writing it down and then coming back to it tomorrow. You can use a gratitude journal or just a journal in general, and you can write like three things that you're grateful for that day or something like that. And then you can write down positive affirmations. So things to kind of program your mind for the next day, like what are you excited about for this week or this month? Or what are the affirmations that you need to keep telling yourself that make you feel good? There's lots of different ways you can do this. And there's lots of journals out there that have prompts in them. So you don't have to remember a prompt or come up with one. We also want to think about like nightly blood sugar levels. So if blood sugar levels drop during the night, it releases glucose regulating hormones such as adrenaline, glucagon, cortisol, and growth hormone. This process can wake you up and, you know, we really don't want that. Eat no later than two hours before going to bed. This one is really hard. I I struggle with this one. Consume slowly digestible foods such as meat no later than four hours before bedtime. This allows the food to be digested in your system and not sit there and potentially be fermented, which could then lead to a host of other, you know, gut health problems. You can try some MCT oil or omega-3 oil before bed. You can also have collagen or whey protein and try a spoonful of organic honey to replenish the liver's glycogen reserves. These reserves are typically depleted in 12 hours. So you really just want to be thinking about your nighttime blood sugar levels. All right, the last thing I want to talk about that I don't hear talked about enough when it comes to sleep 
is waking up. We've talked a lot about what you can do to help you fall asleep, what happens throughout the day, hormones, supplements, all these things you can do. But let's actually talk about the morning. So we want to wake up naturally. We want to have a natural environment that can reduce the stress response caused by a regular alarm clock. I hate alarm clocks. <laughs> I work from home. I do not need an alarm clock. I can wake up naturally. I encourage you to really, really try and figure this out and try to get rid of an alarm clock if you can. Use a wake up light that imitates a natural sunrise. A lot of people love these. I don't have one. There's a ton of them on Amazon you can get. And create a gradually developing soundscape that emulates nature waking up to its full glory. So there is a company out there that has one of these lights or has an alarm clock as well that has this like natural sound to it. I forget the name of it. I'll try to find it. I don't have one, but I know they're quite popular. And I think that could be something that's very natural and helps you to wake up in a very like beautiful, calm state. And then you want to kind of like jumpstart your body. So the body has been fasting for the entire night. Muscles might be tense as a result. But there are ways to kind of reduce this tension. You can have 400 mils of water for rehydration, two tablespoons of lemon juice to balance gastric acids, and half a teaspoon of salt for your adrenal glands within 30 minutes of waking up. You can try inversions and a hand or headstand to improve the circulation in your body and to improve your adrenal glands. You can try yoga, jogging, and stretching. Try a warm shower or bath finished by a cold shower that closes the pores in your skin. And obviously the cold shower really, really wakes you up and is like a little shot of caffeine to the body. You could also try a vibration plate. I've tried these at the gym. I don't own one, but a lot of people love them. Jumping jacks or a mini trampoline to kind of increase blood and lymph circulation. I'm building a home gym, so maybe I'll get one of these because I think that might be a good idea, but I know a lot of people love these. We also want to talk about like measuring and tracking sleep. So this has like become such a popular thing. It used to be such a thing that you would have to go to like a sleep clinic to track your sleep and find out what, how much REM you're having and when did you fall asleep and how many times did you wake up throughout the, throughout the night? And now people just have wearables. So there's even apps on your phone that apparently track your sleep. I don't think that that works necessarily. Also, like, what, are you going to have the phone on your mattress all night so it tracks any movement? It doesn't make sense. I think the best name in the game, obviously, for this is the Aura Ring. I, I think I have a discount with them. I can try find it and put it in the show notes. I've had my Aura Ring for five years. I actually just got my little, like, anniversary notification. And it is fantastic. It is so, so good. And it really helps to understand how you slept last night. Did you sleep well? What can you do better? You know, how are, how's your body feeling today? What was your heart rate? What was your body temperature? What was your HRV? Things like that. And I, I don't know. I don't know if I could like, I could exist without my aura ring for sure, but I, I don't want to. <laughs> I just think it's, I think it's really great. So tips for measuring sleep. There are many consumer products, obviously, that you can get. There's activity trackers and watches with a sleep tracking function. So like the Apple Watch has that as well. You know, like I said, there's the wearable jewelry, such as smart rings and pendants with a sleep tracking function. There are sleep trackers that sense body movements during sleep using radio waves. There's ones that you place underneath the bed sheets. And speaking of that, I actually also have a eight sleep pod. Now, eight sleep is something that essentially it is like a mattress cover. You put it over the mattress, then you put your sheet on top of it, and it hooks up to this pod that plugs in in your, in your wall in your bedroom, and it regulates the temperature of your bed. So this is really cool because it can have two temperatures, like one for you and one for your partner. And it runs water through the mattress cover to maintain these temperatures. And what it does is it will change the temperature throughout the night based on the sleep zone that you're in. So for example, mine is set to, right now it's winter, so set to plus two degrees of like what the core temperature is. It doesn't actually tell you what the temperature is in Celsius or Fahrenheit. It just says like plus two, minus one type of thing. 
So mine's plus two. And then the first half of sleep, once I've fallen asleep, because it tracks when you fall asleep, it goes down. I think mine goes down to zero. And then it goes, the second half of my sleep, it's plus one. And then my wake up temperature is plus two again. So it basically has this rhythm that's been studied of how your temperature drops throughout the night, which we kind of talked about already. And it mimics that to help you sleep better. Now, you know, for example, my husband, he sleeps a lot warmer than I do. So his temperatures are lower, follows the same curve, but he might start at minus one, go down to minus three, come up to minus two, and then wake up to plus one or something like that. So it really works. And, you know, the eight sleep is really great for anyone who has trouble sleeping based on temperature. So if you're a woman in menopause and you're having hot flashes, poof, eight sleep would be phenomenal for you to get it. You can put it to minus 10, have it nice and cold in there, you know, reduce the sweating, that type of thing. You know, you can also make it, it goes like plus 10 to minus 10. So you can make it whatever you want. And it actually, it's, you know, one of these like smart AI things where it kind of studies what your preferences are and then gives you recommendation based on like people who sleep like you. So I will link my eight sleep. I have a discount code with them. It's kind of expensive, very cool to use though. And if you can get one, I would suggest one. I think they're, I think they're great. So in terms of kind of like what your metrics should say, regardless of the device that you're using, we can definitely look at some numbers that can kind of help you figure out, hey, like this is the zone I want to be in. This is optimized and this isn't. So for REM sleep, you want it to be about 20 to 25% of the time you spent sleeping. Deep sleep should be about 10 to 20% of the time you spent sleeping. Ideally, you want to sleep for about seven to eight hours per night. You want to fall asleep quickly in less than 15 minutes. And you want little to no waking up during the night. That is like optimal. Okay. You want to increased HRV, which is heart rate variability during the night, which indicates the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. Heart rate's variability, HF component is sig- sufficiently high. HF increases during the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. Daily resting heart rate in the morning is constant or decreasing compared to the monthly average, which is what you want. Little to no snoring, no unusual restlessness or movements during the night. And the soundscape during the night contains nothing that stands out. That's optimal. That's the best of the best. And if you're hitting most of those points, congratulations, you're doing a great job. (laughs) I think that is something to really, you know, be proud of. I've hit a lot of those points many, many times. I don't know how many times I've hit all of them in one night, but you know, I, I definitely aim for that. Okay. So, you know, going back to just a couple more hacks and like optimizing things that I want to add in is we still, when we're talking about waking up is like, we really just want to focus on a stress-free wake up. Some mornings you kind of, you know, feel energized and fully active while other times you might feel slow and groggy, no matter how many hours you've slept. This is most likely caused by waking up from the deepest stages of sleep while adenosine is still affecting your central nervous system. A regular alarm clock is not intelligent enough to differentiate between these different stages of sleep. With specific technologies, it is possible to have an alarm clock that wakes you up at the right moment. This is possible with the kind of apps that monitor the stages of sleep and attempt to wake you up when you are in your lighter phase of sleep like REM. You know, there are different ones that you can do and you can definitely like find these online. So cortisol which is like the so-called stress hormone production is at its peak around 30 minutes after waking up. At that moment, your adrenal glands will produce about 50% more cortisol than normal. Waking up earlier than you usually do further accentuates the stress response. According to various studies, the stress response may be alleviated through the following methods. Unpronounced soundscapes during the night, so sounds of nature or distant traffic noise reduces the stress response in the morning. Waking up later in the morning, waking up in the dark rather than in the daylight, and stressful experiences and thoughts about a mounting workload can increase stress response in the morning. Obviously, that makes sense. 
the night before, write down wandering thoughts and three most important things you need to do the next day. We talked about this. We talked about meditation, things like that. Okay, so I think that's basically it. The only other thing that I want to give you, my last little tidbit, is kind of a midnight snack. You know, I am a nutritionist after all. So I have experimented many times with what to eat if I wake up in the middle of the night or what to eat before going to bed. So here's kind of some ideas that you can follow. So you can mix some of these together and see kind of what works for you. So you can do like half an avocado, a handful of soaked and crushed almonds or raw pumpkin seeds, or just nuts in general are filled with healthy fat and protein. These are very satiating, will help you fall asleep versus like eating crackers that are going to spike your blood glucose levels and then potentially wake you up 30 minutes to an hour later. You could do one tablespoon of unpasteurized honey with this, half a banana, but not overripe, and a touch of unrefined salt. That could be really good. I know some people do, I think it's like a tablespoon. They like load a tablespoon and it'll be like a little bit of coconut oil, raw unpasteurized honey, and then some salt sprinkled on top. And they'll have that right before they go to bed or they'll have that in the middle of the night. That can be really great. Just make sure that there's like that healthy fat in there. And then you can also add in like other things like chamomile, bee pollen, and things that are nutrient dense like that. Okay, this episode was filled with tons of different things that you can do to optimize your health and your sleep. I hope you got a lot out of this. You know, I thought it was going to be a short episode. It wasn't. (laughs) Thank you for sticking around. All of the things that I mentioned will be linked in the show notes so that you can find them easily and on my website. If you have questions about something I said, or you're like, hey, you didn't add this link to the show notes and you said you would, just send me a message and I will do it. It's not, it's not difficult. I am most active on TikTok and Instagram. TikTok is just biohacking, Instagram, biohacking, Brittany, and please subscribe leave a review, a rating, everything that helps kind of the show get noticed more. You know, we are in the top 1.5% of podcasts now globally. I would love to hit the top 1% by the end of the year. Who knows if that will happen? That It's actually quite a big leap when, if you look at the statistics from going from 1.5 to 1. So hopefully that will happen. I'm putting it into the universe. Thank you for listening. And I will catch you on another episode later this week. Thanks for listening to another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. If you're interested in finding the show notes or the sponsors for this episode, you can do so on my website, which is biohackingbrittany.com. Remember to follow me on Instagram where I'm most active. My handle is at biohackingbrittany. And if you're interested in working together and you want to email me directly, you can do that. My email is info at biohackingbrittany.com. And I look forward to hearing from you and having you tune in next week.